Ebony, and thank you so much, Ebony, for the great introduction. And props to you and the Kresge crew for just presenting uh, these impactful salons. Now, as stated, this series is designed to showcase in advance the 2022 Kresge Artist Fellows, the Guild Awardees, creative practices. So we've got two standout artists today, and we're going to be viewing presentations from Joel, Fluent Green, and Day. Now, Angelina is going to screen share that for us to take a closer look and to peer and glimpse into the work of these artists. Now, if you just so happen to experience issues with your Zoom connection and the video doesn't happen to come through, uh, we'll also drop a link in the chat where you can view the video on your own while at the same time that it's playing via Zoom. And then you can be readmitted into the meeting if you need to drop off to personally view the presentation. Now, if you've got any questions that come to mind while you're watching the presentation, feel free to drop them in chat right away and we'll get those questions addressed. So at this time, we're gonna hand it off to our first presenting artist. We wanna set the stage for you and bring to the Kresge Artist Salon platform, Day. And Day, perhaps you can introduce yourself and then set up your video presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you, Kresge, for hosting this. Um, and thank you, Chris, for moderating. Um, my name is Day. I'm a music producer, sound artist, and interdisciplinary artist. Um, I'd say my practice is divided into two parts. So I like write songs and produce music. And then I have a practice that's more experimental based and sound installation based. So my video today is um, going more in depth on a recent installation I did called Water of the Dead. I hosted it in 2021 at Gabriel Richard Park and in 2022 on Belle Isle at Lake Okanoka. Um, so this video is just giving a little more detail into what that was about. I hope you guys enjoy. We belong to a holy circle, a compass, a centripetal force pulling us in, out, and around. Our sweet spiral divided by a threshold. With a flowing boundary marking death and a flowing boundary marking life. Between them, there's a stream of water, a reflective blue, a natural body of static. Between them, there's a stream of water, a reflective blue, a natural body of static. An abyss of spirit. A holy circle where no goodbye is gone. A holy circle where no goodbye is gone. Where we never forget even that which we consciously have never remembered. A holy circle where we borrow, sample, reproduce, and make old feel new. Real niggas can't die, we only spiral, we only multiply, and back to this threshold. On the other side, there's living, breathing, afterlife, beyond life, meta life. Shit, we must touch water to feel. Pools of water anywhere create depth. Black holes out of solid places. Pools of water anywhere create depth. Black holes out of solid spaces. In 2021, I showed the first iteration of Water of the Dead at Gabriel Richard Park. And in 2022, the second iteration at Lake Okanoka on Belle Isle Park. Water of the Dead is a sound installation housed within a shipping container that's mounted with speakers and a projector. It's a transportation device, a liminal place, a space between places and other world. Through the use of field recordings, a composed score and sampling, the sound installation traces black identity through a series of auditory cues centered around water, creating an abstract womb-like space that's meditative 
and haunting. The score is made up of a combination of recorded interviews and a chopped and screwed version of a Negro spiritual I grew up singing. I grew up in a black church where Negro spirituals were my first introduction to music. In Water of the Dead, I used spirituals as source material for experimentation. I like taking this heavy, emotionally dense sonic material and warping it. Through sound design, sampling, and synthesis, I created this new piece of sound art that's rooted in a form of music that's generations old, but rendered in an abstract way where the blues of the music becomes meditative and ethereal. I like occupying this abstract space in my work. I think it is a way for preserving the energy behind it, which is very spiritual and personal. When learning about the Bakongo Cosmogram, the symbol that inspired me as an artist, human being, and this work specifically, I found this proverb that translated to, don't seek for the center of social ways if you don't belong to the community and a system. Do not force open somebody else's system's door when it is not open to you. The system must open itself up to you. I used abstraction as a way to assert this value, essentially codifying the installation in a way that everyone can experience, but only black people truly get. <laughs> Very profound piece of uh, curated and visual art. Congrats and props to you, Day. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, let's just uh, chop it up. Uh, I saw a lot of symbolism in your presentation. And uh, before we get into the questions, just to remind our, our viewers that are assembled here, if you have any questions that you'd like to address Day with, throw that in the chat and we'll get those on for sure. Uh, water. That seemed to be a, just a, a very profound and prolific symbolism in your presentation. Uh, what made you craft your presentation around water and also spirituality and the spiritual community? Um, I can't say exactly what made me do it, um, but it was definitely inspired by my research into the history of the griot. And then from there, I like found this symbol called the Bakongo Cosmogram, which is essentially like this compass and on the if you look at it it's a circle and then on the top half um it's like land and the peak masculine energy and the underneath is water and that's like peak feminine energy in the land of the spirits and then the circles basically traces like our circle of life so birth all the way up until death um and i think when I came up with the idea for Water of the Dead, I had experienced a loss um, that was from someone very close to my family who I grew up with. And so I think a lot of it has to do with like a response to grief um, and wanting to connect with something 
larger than myself and this tangible world uh, and creating this space where I could. So in the initial like installation work, I did a lot of interviews with people, my family and like strangers that I didn't know and recorded their voices. So like there's this element of like archival you know, the archiving of voices. And then there's this element of like the composed music and creating this space where I could myself enter and feel connected. I saw a lot of Detroit visual staples, especially at the beginning of that presentation. I saw ballroom dancing. I, I saw um, kind of like the, the gospel community as well. Uh, briefly describe how some of those Detroit elements factored into your conceptualization of your presentation. Um, I think one is just this idea of movement, uh, the circle, like that's kind of like the central element of the whole installation is this circle and then there's water. Um, Detroit is a city that's like on a moving body of water, like the river. Um, and so that connects us to this larger landmass. And then from there, we're connected to like the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so I think geographically, like that's really a huge part of it. And then just growing up Detroit, up in Detroit, I went to this black church and I like practiced many messianic Judaism. And, you know, I grew up, we sang and we couldn't use instruments. So like a lot of like my musical background is specifically re related to Detroit. Um, and so that's, you know, it's just really about like my own personal relationship to Detroit and how that just kind of like organically shows up in the work. It wasn't like an intentional thing, but it just organically happens. Absolutely. Now, according to your bio here, uh, while you grew up in Detroit, you spent some time overseas uh, in England, uh, where you went to university. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and describe just how the Black experience contrasts between America and there and how that perhaps informed some of the concept for your video. Um. I can't speak to like the black experience there like fully just because I was living in um, Southwest England. So I didn't interact with lots of black people, but the few friends I did have, they were like from London. Um, but I do think that kind of like crossing waters, but on my own accord, like, you know, like being intentionally, I'm crossing, like I had my own passageway across the ocean again. Um, and I think like having that distance from like Detroit and America, um, it allowed me to see things from a more like objective point of view, um, which I don't think I would have gotten if I had just been remained here. Now you are an accomplished uh, musical artist. You, you've released um, music, you've released an EP. Um, just sort of tell us, too, how that played into your putting together the video. I mean, you've got that visual aesthetic, but then you've got the music training as well. How important and foundational was the music, music training when you were putting together this video? Um, so for music, like, that's my, like, base. Like, I grew up doing music. I wasn't necessarily interested in doing visual arts. And, like, the visual component of the installation, it really is a sound installation to me, but the visual component is just aiding in the like, so that you can hear it, like having the speakers. If I had just put the speakers in a formless place, I don't think it would have been impactful. So like when I made the music, I was intentional, like, okay, I needed to feel like a womb-like space. So I needed to be enclosed. And so then that made me think of like, okay, how can I create something that's enclosed with materials that are around me? And then shipping containers, like Kind of to add to your question before about Detroit, like Detroit is a port city. So we have these shipping containers all the time and I see them like very passively. But when I was thinking about the installation, I was like, oh, that's something I can use. And like, this is already in my environment and there's like a ton of them on 4th Street. Um, so music is my like foundation and I'm always thinking about things from a musical perspective. And then the visual elements are just to aid in the, basically the effectiveness of the music. Now let's talk a little bit about Kresge. Uh, what are your personal feelings at being recognized for your work by an organization as esteemed as this one? Um, I feel very blessed, um, very thankful. Uh, I just really want to use the opportunity in a good way um, to further my work and help the people I'm in community with to continue their work. What are your short and long-term long goals uh, for the installation? 
Um, I like to be able to show it at other places. I have different iterations of it. So right now I'm working with a black web designer. Her name is Lasha Marie. Um, and we're going to do an iteration of it that completely lives virtually online. Um, but it won't just be like, oh, here's a video that's just on a website. We're really trying to like use code to create a portal online, like a special space uh, online so that you get the same feeling of this womb-like space, but of course it's virtually. Um, let's go into the future. Uh, where do you see yourself five or 10 years in the future with your art, both musically and visually? Um, hopefully I'll have my work in some museums and galleries. Um, and then on the other side of that, I want to be like producing for other musicians that I'm in community with. Um, I'd like to build a sound archive that's accessible for people across the diaspora. So that's a big goal of mine, like doing a musical pilgrimage across West Africa and learning traditional instruments and like building relationships with musicians there and building like the sound archive that's accessible for everyone. Um, yeah. We've got a question in chat that we want to address, and that is, and this comes from Brandon, what were the biggest challenges with curating the installation? Hi, Brandon. Um, the biggest challenges I would say were the logistics. I think when you have something in your mind, you have a conceptual idea and you're like, okay, I can see it and put it together. But then when you're actually doing something, you realize like, oh, there are all these other little parts of things that I don't really understand. Like for me, I'm not a construction worker. Like I've never really painted anything except for doing this installation. But if you saw in the video, like I was out there sanding the outside of the shipping container and I didn't really understand that all this stuff would be needed to be done until like until real time. Like I got the shipping container and I was like, okay, well, I need to paint this. And I'm on Google, like, okay, what needs to happen for me to paint this? And I'm like, okay, I need to sand this. So all that kind of stuff, like the logistics, I think were the, the most complicated thing, the music and the concept. I spent like almost a year kind of sitting on it and baking it in my head, but the actual piece having it like live outside of my notebook in real life was the most difficult thing. That's what's up. Got one more question from chat. What would you say to the Christian person regarding water of dead and its relationship to the afterlife? Um, I think, you know, water shows up in Christianity uh, hugely. You know, I like grew up in this like Christian Judeo church. Um, so like, you know, if you think about baptism, water in Christianity is this element of transformation. Um, when you get baptized, you know, they dip you in water and now you're anew. And so it's the same thing. Like when we talk about the Bakongo Constantogram and crossing this threshold of water, you become um, new and you're like in this new life and new personhood. So I would think, you know, it's huge similarities. And that came from uh, Wendy, by the way. Hi, then... Wendy. Oh, hi, mom. <laughs> <laughs> and let's see, we have one from Atheldra. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And her question is, how long did it take to complete the project? Um, from inception to it being done, I would say about six months. Um, most of the work, well, most of the like timeline was spent just trying to get licensing from like the city to be able to put it at a place um, the first time around. So a lot of it was literally that, but then once I got approval, it took about three weeks. Well, I actually just had three weeks to show it. Like, so I got the shipping container, then three weeks I had to prep it, um, make sure I had all the equipment and everything. Okay, very well. And then uh, lastly, for those that are looking to get into either the visual arts or uh, the musical arts like you are, uh, what words of advice would you have for them? And how can they utilize organizations like Kresge uh, to help promote their work as well? Um, I would say if you wanna do anything, uh, you kind of have to do it on your own first. Um, and like, I wouldn't lean on any institution or, you know, if, if it's something that you want to do, I think it's best to figure out a way to do it on your own first. And then once you have that like proof of concept and can figure it out and understand like, this is my vision, this is what I want to do, 
And then after that, you can look for that support. Um, but I think for me, like that was my process. I kind of did this without any support initially. Um, I was just like, I have this idea. And, you know, because of the pandemic, I had some extra unemployment money. So I used it and I was like, okay, this is something I want to see happen. And then I was able to do it. And it was initially really just all about me and like what I wanted to see exist for me and my community. And then after that, I was like, okay, well, I want to do this again. Like, let me find resources and support. Um, so I really think like, yeah, nothing like just, I mean, I understand there are challenges and difficulties like in the creative process, but if there's something you want to do it, do figure out how to do it. Like, even if it has to be on that small scale, um, do it for yourself first. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, let's check chat one more time. And we're getting uh, just a lot of our responses. Hi, uh, everyone's <laughs> Hi, saying beautiful. Malika. It's an affirmation. Do it on your own. I think they really felt that affirmation from you. Uh, so we really appreciate uh, the video, the presentation, your thoughts and your methodologies behind your work. Don't go away because uh, we're going to bring you back uh, towards the end of this uh, with a final round of questions and uh, and then to um, learn a little bit more about you at the end of this program. Thank you so much, Les. Thank you. Well, at this time, our next artist that we're going to bring center stage is Joel Fluent Green, and uh, he really needs no introduction, but we're going to let him introduce himself anyhow, and he can set up uh, his video presentation. Joel, the floor is yours. I do need introduction. What are you talking about? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Please go ahead. Uh, my I mean, come on. My name is Joel Fluent Green. I'm a, a poet, uh, Detroit based. Uh, I love the city. I've been doing this for a long time, uh, many, many years, over two decades of stuff, events and things like that. I'm a self-published author, I'm working on getting that to a, a larger, larger level, which I'm really happy about. Um, yeah, I, I, I educate. I do workshops with adults and, and youth as well. And I'm happy to be here. And uh, set up your video presentation. OK, so this video is basically uh, focusing. Well, I figured you know, this is an opportunity for me to do so much, right? It's a big platform and all that. But I want to focus on what I do for the community. One of the things, one thing is I'm here at Mariner's Inn. I'll talk about that later. Uh, but two is I also do an event called the Half a Stack Poetry Slam which uh, over the past many years, I've uh, dished out about $10,000 to many poets around the city, outside the city, whatever. Um, so it's basically 12 poets that come to compete for $500 prizes every time. So this video is just focusing on my last event, uh, some of the poets that performed, um, the venue, which is Detroit Public Theater, which is a beautiful space that I'm blessed to be in, and just something that's really cool in the community that I wanted to really give a, a nice highlight to, so. All right, let's do it. So today, what's up everybody? Kresge Arts in Detroit was happening. All my Gilded people, all my Kresge Awardees was happening. Um, anybody watching, today we're at Detroit Public Theater over, over here on 3rd in Midtown. Um, I do an event here uh, once a month actually. This is my Half a Stack Poetry Slam number 16. I've done 16 of these and over the years we've awarded over $10,000 to many, many poets from Detroit, around Detroit, outside Detroit, over, over 10,000. So I'm really proud of this event. I'm happy to be here. And I figured, you know, I could do a salon just focused on me, 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 but this is what I do for the community. I'm really proud of this event. It's something I've cultivated and really nurtured over many years. And so to be at a point where we're expecting like 200 people tonight, if you can see this room, uh, 200 plus people in this room tonight, it's gonna be beautiful. And this is, this comes from many, many, many years of hard work. I was talking to the homie Kari Frazier over there a minute ago about how, um, how long it's taken to actually cultivate and really build this type of thing up. It takes hard work, dedication, a lot of sweat, uh, a lot of running to the ATM, paying people a week later some days, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Just real talk, but now I'm at a point where everything is beautiful and dope. 
And um, that's one of my favorite things about being a Detroit creative is being a bridge and in a position where I can do events like this. People come out, have a good time, get some entertainment, uh, win some money. I got my daughter back there being my assistant today. Um, so I'm really grateful for Detroit for um, getting me to this point that I'm at right now. Definitely. Yeah.
but a score of 28.9. We have Trocon. I was six foot at the age of 12 with a nasty jump shot. I was an incredible nasty Nas Escobar with a basketball, but it was not enough for my father to give me a jump start towards NBA stardom. For starters, my father is a numbers guy, an accountant by trade who figured the odds of me making it to the NBA wasn't even worth the investment. Mm. He's a West African Liberian who migrated to this country, who worked at Farmer Drax, Chrysler, and slave labored in libraries. And that's me, our number one champion. I must have a pacemaker in my throat. They tell me to use halls, but my voice still hasn't moved. I love, I love, I fuck. Every time it matters, it won't come out. I miss, I, I guess, feeling isn't enough inspiration for vibration. If a deaf person told you they loved you, how does it feel knowing they've never heard it themselves? Oh. Is the feeling not enough? Could you imagine a more beautiful tune in a universe where everything moves? I found myself with a still voice. Maybe if I took more breaths, I'd have enough carbon to at least sparkle. Is it my words falling into deaf ears? Or am I whispering the ball? Amazing. I would just want to first of all give you your flowers because uh, one thing that jumped out at me in that video, uh, you were putting poets on, you were cultivating their talents, and this is something that you've been doing for decades. I remember moving back here, in New York, in like 1998, and you're doing the same thing at Cafe Mahogany. Uh, you're impacting generations, and for that, you deserve your flowers, good brother. From Cafe Mahogany to Mariner's Inn to uh, residencies at the Detroit Music Hall and everything else in between. Uh, you're, you're one of the architects. You're one of the architects of this of this scene. And um, you've done so in a very iconic, iconoclastic way and in a way that has really cultivated this and empowered just generations. So that, that jumped out at me. Flowers given right there. Thank you. Thank you, man. Receive, brother, receive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at a point in my life I've accepted all the love, bro. Listen, I'm getting like, we get a couple of OG man. It's like, look, Damn. no stress, no stress. Enjoy, have fun, make art. You know, what yes. I'm saying? love, love on people. That's it. That's where I'm at. Well, so here's where I'm, here, here's the context I'm putting it in. Electrify Mojo had us on radio. Nat Morris had us on TV. You have us with the poetry, performance poetry. You know, yeah, man. You, you, you made it palatable. So let's talk about this video a little bit before we jump into a lot of other things. Um, just talk about the, the concept of the video. What's one takeaway that you want people to take away from this video presentation? Oof. The importance of when you get to a point in your career where you're eating, you're paying your bills, things are good, you're working all the time, um, you're showing up well, you're happy, you're healthy, you're feeling right. It's yeah. important to get back because we work to get to that point. There are a lot of days it wasn't like that for me. So now that it's good, it's even more important that I sow into the community. You know what I'm saying? I could sit back and be like, all right, well, you know, <laughs> but it's, yeah, that's not yeah. who I am. I was doing it when I didn't have a dime. Yeah. So if I got two dimes, I'm going to do it, you know what I'm saying, even harder. So that's mm -hmm. the way I feel. So to anybody that's watching this, like they said, do it for yourself first. After all that work you're doing, and then when you get to that point where it's like, okay, I'm feeling like 
I got a hold on my career. It takes a while when you're doing creative arts. Yeah. You know I mean, you know what I'm saying? Whether it's visual art, whatever, you know, it takes a while to get a footing. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so I've known so many people I've seen shine, like Sheaf, you, you know what I'm saying? People that are stalwart, committed people that like, I've been doing this, I'm at it. Pretty soon it's yeah. like, boom, shine. And so when that happens for you, that's a blessing. Give it back. Yeah. Now, I thought it was so beautiful, uh, your daughter, you've been incorporating her into a lot of your, your artistic works and, and things. Mm -hmm. And and I'm seeing, you know, just a, a newer generation em embracing spoken word, spoken word yeah. poetry. How does that make you feel uh, to just have an impact on, you know, the, this, this younger generation embracing the arts? Oh, in man. much the same manner you did. It feels good, man. I, I know cats that really just definitely remind me of myself, not literally, mm -hmm. but the same energy, the same love for the city, the same love for the culture and the arts. Yeah. And they're really sewing in, being bridges, supplying poets with opportunities and stages. And I see this happening and they tell me, man, you are an example. I've heard two, yesterday, I'm hanging out with two young brothers, Hakeem, the people's poet, and my man mm -hmm. Free Loke, right? Shout out yeah. to them. They do events at Rock Local in Highland Park all the time. So if you're looking for some young energy, some dope energy that reminds you like Cafe Mahogany, mm. Rock Local. These are young cats. They're getting it in. Uh, men, women, they're just, it's, it's, just, it's amazing. And so um, shout out to them. But I was talking to them yesterday and they, they just showed me so much love. And it makes me feel good because that's, you got to be an example like that. You can't be the kind of artist that's getting all the love and you ain't putting nobody on. You know, we Absolutely. all know people like that. And I, I could never be like that ever. That ain't me. And so if I'm known for anything in this city, if they don't remember none of my poems, they're gonna remember the love. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'll take it. I mean, please remember at least one poem, but if you know, if it's the, if I'll take the love too, though. Yeah. Talk about the poetry scene. Uh, what's the biggest differences that you see in it from the Cafe Mahogany days of the late 90s, early 2000s to till now? <laughs> I mean, well, you know, I could be like an old head that sound like, well, things were better, and that, but no, things weren't better. I think. We were forced to be more close knit back then because we didn't have the internet like that. It was around, but it was new. Yeah, and so yeah. it's like we weren't like social media wasn't even a thing really. And so uh, we were close, we were forced to like look uh, look up in like the Metro Times or Real Detroit or to hear from friends or to walk around the mall and meet people. And before you know it, you're going to a party or something and you're going to an open mic. So I think the scene back then was just more like, I don't know. You know, it's interesting, man. I was young back then too. So I know these, I've, I've watched these young people get together and commune and it reminds me of the same vibe, the same energy. So who am I? I think that I really think it's not a big difference, man. I think that back then poetry was hot, maybe had a little low for a while because Love Jones and all that kind of kicked things in the, you know, mm -hmm. around the country, the poetry was right. hot. Chicago, Detroit, DC, wherever, hot. And then, um, a little low, it became like a regular thing, like kind of an accepted thing. You know, we do this in the city. We have slams. We have a lot of black poetry scenes and things like that in different pockets of the country. Um, but then also, um, I think, uh, I don't know, man. I, I, it's not a big difference. I'm trying to sit here and be very like, you know, honest. I, I, I right, think right. that the love is the love was there then. It's there now. Um, I think we're at a point where poetry is definitely like. It's a, it's a thing. It's an accepted. Jay Ivey just got a Grammy, brother. You know what I'm saying? For a spoken word. That, that blew Shout my mind, Jay too. Ivey. That blew yes, my mind. Listen. Yeah. And so that's where we're at with spoken word. It's an accepted, it's an accepted discipline, which I love. Because we worked really hard, people like me, Jessica, all these people. Talk about know. when it wasn't, because it, it always wasn't an accepted thing. I mean, there was a time that, you know, corporations, corporate community didn't get it, and they didn't see the value in it. You know, just talk about how what the struggle was like in, in kind of getting a level of acceptance for, for spoken word. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what did it, man. You know, I think uh, little by little, you would see spoken word artists on like rap albums or R and B album popping up. And it just became a thing where I think the people forced it to be a thing. You know what I'm saying? Like we made it a thing. You know, of course, yeah, now I could definitely do. I just did a, a poem for the Detroit Lions just wearing the jacket, you know what I'm saying? Wow, <laughs> and they, wow. they didn't pay me to do this, by the way. I'm just wearing the jacket. But <laughs> I just did one for them. And it's like, yeah, I never thought I'd be that guy to do corporate, um, you know, things like that, corporate collaborations and things like that. But at the same time, that's where we're at with poetry. It's acceptable um, and it's accepted. So I'm happy we got to this point. It was never easy. Uh, a lot of us really worked hard for that. But that's where it mm -hmm. is now, which is pretty cool. And even still now, you got to explain it to some people still, you right. know, obviously it's still spoken words, poetry, people don't really quite get it all the time. But I think there's been enough exposure around the world that people are kind of used to seeing it on TV 
wherever, whatever. You know, Def Poetry Jam helped a lot in the in 2000s, early 1990s. I mean, late 1990s to 2000s, that helped out. So it's just a, it's a thing now, it's accepted. Any, any Black community, especially in this country, Oakland, you know, LA, wherever you go, you know, they're going to find a spoken word spot an open mic, for real. And that says something about us, the nature of the griot, that history with Black folks, you know what I'm saying? Storytelling, Absolutely. right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We got a couple questions from chat. Uh, one yeah. is from Etheldra. When is the next slam? That's her uh, question. I, I saw that, Etheldra. What's up, Etheldra? Uh, the next slam is going to be in July. Um, so if you follow my social media, uh, Joel Fluent Green um, on Instagram or Facebook, I'll be posting that. But the next slam, my next proper slam is in July. I do events monthly, though. So you want to come to an event? I'm having one actually for Mother's Day. So any mothers that are watching right now, we're having one called Mother Poet, featuring some amazing mothers that are also poets and uh, headlining uh, Jessica Caremore. So, I mean, it's going to be, she's the ultimate mother slash poet, right? So it just made sense to have that. Um, yeah, definitely. Oh, I love Dave's question. I just thought, can we hop to that question? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, could, but I have my own space. Yes. Yep, yeah. Do you have any long-term plans for your opening yes. your own space? Yes, Day. Yes, I'm glad you asked that. And she's giving that young, dope energy. That's what I'm mm -hmm. talking about. See, what I was, that's how you got to think. I encourage people to think like that because, yeah, I've been activating many spaces. Yes. A lot of these spaces ain't really appreciate me like that. I ain't going to lie. A lot of them, did, they'll put your name on the thing and on the website and all this stuff to help them raise money, but they don't really appreciate a lot of Black artists in Detroit like that. So, yes, I need my own space for sure. Definitely day. And that has a long term plan. Let's make working on the money day. I just started getting it a couple years ago. So, yeah. <laughs> Once I stack a little bit, you know, handle some business and get used to a life of of not uh, you know, of unparalleled life. I don't know if that's a word, but <laughs> then, yeah, it'll happen. Thank you for that question, though, Day. That's real. Another question uh from Ebony. Uh, and she has uh there, there's an author with a work of art. Hurricane Lexi, and she'd like to learn how can she connect uh, with you? Oh, okay, yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, Joel Fluent Green presents at Gmail. That's my uh, business email. You can always send me something about videos, performance videos, flyers for stuff, whatever. I'm open. You know, I don't always check stuff all the time like I should. I have an artist with a mind of an artist, but please send me stuff, social media. You see me on public, just let me know what you do. Um, I'm pretty open to it. I love meeting new artists, new poets. You know, I think that um, in my responsibility, it's my responsibility to open the door to new artists. I can't just book the same 10 people all the time. I wouldn't do it. It wouldn't happen. So I'm listening, always listening, always looking. Um, that's why I went to Rock Local, like I said, in Highland Park to see what was going on in the community. So yeah, if you want to tap in with me, just send me a message or something. Send me a video, make it easy. Have stuff though. I, you know, I can't just do it sight or, or unseen or unheard, you know, so definitely have something for me to check out. But besides that, I'm open. Now, let's hit up the cafe mythology days, um, cafe mahogany days, and just talk about that. Because, um, you know, we, you know, around that time, Deaf Poetry Jam, Love Jones, all that stuff was popping. But, you know, everyone, people that were associated with all of those projects were aware of cafe mahogany. And speaking of Cafe Mahogany, Cats Like the Roots, Erica Badu, Common, you know, that whole Neil Soul thing that was popping at the time, they all sort of had inroads to Cafe Mahogany. Yeah. Now that you're, now that we're, I don't know, 20 some odd years, you know, past that, what do you feel Cafe Mahogany's impact was not only on the local scene, but also just nationally on the spoken word scene? Because there was a national effect and impact as well. Yeah, man, I'm going to proudly say that Mahogany, um, and Dave will be interested in the, cafe, the history of that because it was a Black-owned spot downtown Detroit, if she's not familiar, um, and uh, it was beautiful. So the plan is to have a place like Cafe Mahogany one day, stage, bar, vibes, food, all that. But to answer your question, um, it was a beautiful time. It definitely influenced things world. I mean, well, yeah, why not? I mean, in the poetry community, yes. If you're if you're a yeah. black poet, especially black poetry community, you definitely speak on it. I, speak on it. Let's, I'm gonna be honest. I mean, yeah, yeah I heard, I saw a poet say one day. I'm not gonna say any names, but a poet said that mahogany was overrated, and I was like, "How? You were there. You know what? Overrated, bro. Don't don't even play." Because the truth of the matter is, we influenced a lot. Definitely, people like Common, The Roots. All of them used to come to Mahogany, you yeah. know what I'm saying? All these guys, you know, commenting in them, they were recording, you know, Eminem was recording upstairs in the Harmony Park Studios, yeah. Royce 5-9, all this stuff was going on at the same time in this in this community. And I know what it was. I know who came from Mahogany. Dominique Morso, Tony-nominated playwright, came from Mahogany. 
you know, you went to Mahogany, Kari Turner went to Mahogany. You know, come on, let's not play, you know, with Mahogany's name. So many people. And I think a lot of times we don't want to recognize the influence of certain things because we don't feel ownership around it or a part of it. But the reality is the reality. And yeah, Mahogany was a beautiful thing. So I don't talk about it a lot because I don't rest on my laurels. You know what I'm saying? I don't, I don't just, oh, Mahogany, that's it all day. I don't talk about it a lot. I don't like just Mahogany guy. No, I, I'm Mariner's Zen guy. I'm half a stack poetry slam guy. I'm Joe Fluent Green Presents for show. But Mahogany was a, a beautiful part of my life that really opened the door for me. That's, that was my start. I was 19 years old. You know what I'm saying? I'm 19, brother. Yeah, I was 19 hosting. Zayna from Spectacles asked me to host. When Zayna and Corey were promoting it. Yeah. She asked me to host. I did it. I did it for three years. Moved on. Rod Beard did it after me. You know, I think Sparrow even hosted for a minute, perhaps. I'm not sure. Um, it was a beautiful, and there was a host, there were a couple hosts before me. You know what I'm saying? So it was, a, it, it nurtured a lot of people's creativity and brought a lot of people into this creative space that we are in right now. So Mahogany was essential to poetry history. Let's be honest. I yeah. think so, for sure. Performance poetry, spoken word history for Black people in the United States of America between the years of 19, whatever, to now, yes. Yes, very important. Thank you. Let's go. And there's no, there's no doubt. I'll challenge anybody. Thank you. And I do believe you should trademark hand claps, toe taps, and dap. Because you started nah, that. Hand claps, you, finger snaps, toe finger taps, snaps, and toe taps, and dap. Yes. 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 Yeah, it's so funny. My, my young homie, Lope, he, uh, he co-hosted with me yesterday at the Charles H. Wright. I do third Thursdays there. Yeah. And so like showing love and bringing people in, my young homie, Free Lope, was the co-host. And so um, he's got a very similar energy, good brother. And I've known him since he was a kid, which is crazy. He was one of my poetry programs back in the day. And now we're co-hosting as grown men together. It's so wild. And but um he says hand claps, finger snaps, or whatever, like kind of in tribute. It makes me feel good. You know what I'm saying? He don't mm -hmm. say it the exact same way, but he says it. And that's what it is, man. You know. I mean, there's a lot of people saying that, but you you started that. I, mean, I did. I've heard yeah. people nationally saying that. So man, let's go. Man, go Cafe Mahogany. That's what's up. That's what's up. Yeah, it's that. Now, Let's pivot over to Mariner's End because you've been there uh, for a minute. And, and just yeah. tell me, just break down the work that you're doing there because that's a little different from what you did at Mahogany and a little different from what you did at, do at the Music Hall. Uh, explain just Mariner's End and, and, and how you're using that as a way to uplift and give back as well. I love Mariner's End. This is where I am right now. If you see this library, we're in the library here at Mariner's. You know, I had to put a sign on the door and say, don't disturb right now. We're doing the video. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, I love this place. The men here are amazing. I've been here for seven years now. I teach a pro. Oh, <laughs> thing fell out. Sorry. I teach. A <laughs> you guys hear me? All right. Sorry about that. I teach a, a, a poetry, and um, it's basically like a, a poetry spoken word uh, writing workshop every Wednesday from two to three thirty. So I'm here today just to hang out with my bros. We had a video that actually aired on live in the D earlier, so I came to watch it with them. Um, showing some love to the program, basically. So shout out to April Morton and Live for the D for focusing on Mariners. Um, but anyway, um, it's every Wednesday, 2 to 3.30. I've been here for seven years. Um, it's amazing. This is one of those opportunities that came from me volunteering just of my time. Like I was asked by a counselor to come do this and I did it twice. And then I, from there, it turned into a regular job. You know what I'm saying? Where it's like a thing. So I've been here for seven years now. I've met some amazing poets, amazing writers. I'm never surprised at the level of talent that's in this place. These are men that deal with things like addiction, homelessness, um, a lot of some mental health, a lot of mental, mental health issues, things like that. Just real, real men of all ages from like 18 to like 60 something. Like our uncles, our cousins, our brothers, our fathers, real talk, you know what I'm saying? The men we know in our community, a lot the ones we walk by, I don't say nothing to. These are the kind of men that are here at Mariners. And um, it's a grateful, I'm grateful for this, man. This is the best thing I do in my career. Mahogany is beautiful. All these things, I've done a million youth workshops. Beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. That's the youth. That's mm -hmm. the youth. That's beautiful. But these men to come in here and to see men cry, men that never wrote a poem in their life, to see mm -hmm. men of all races, backgrounds, sexualities, you know, ages, all these different things come together, right? And and write beautiful poems in, in a non-judgmental, beautiful space. There's never been any beefs or issues or nothing. It's just been a beautiful thing for seven years. I feel safe. I feel loved. I feel protected by these brothers here. I feel like if I saw them anyway, I see them all the time. I go downtown. If I go downtown right now, I run into a brother from Mariners in. Yeah, and they'll be like, what's up, Fluent? What's up, Poetry? They'll call me Poetry Man. What's up, Poetry Man? You know what I'm saying? These are my brothers. And so I've met lifelong friends. I've lost friends that I've met here, unfortunately. It's it's not an easy process. It's recovery. And so I'm just here to offer a little light, a lot of light um, in between that recovery process. You know what I'm saying? So if anybody wants to look up Mariners in, it's marinersin.org. 
Um, you touched on this a little bit, but let's talk a little bit about black masculinity in the arts, because, you know, yeah. there, there was a time that uh, to me, there was a, 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 I don't know, to me, toxic masculinity as it, it, it pertains to the arts, you know, being able to express yourself, you know, especially in the black community, you know, we come yeah. from, uh, you know, a community that it, it, at least back in the day, it wasn't really looked on positively to be able to express yourself, to, ex to be vulnerable. How have you been able to just sort of use your art to even fight against toxic masculinity? Hmm. I think by being an example and talking about all the things, I'm, I'm not a reactionary poet. Like my poetry is very much, I talk about when I was depressed, I talked about my depression. Yeah. You know, when I was a new father, I talked about my, my fatherhood and how I felt about me being a father, how I felt about that and, and the fears and the love and the joy and all the things, right? The regret, mm -hmm. the pain, everything. Um, I talk about all the things. I, I write little short poems and put them out into the ether and don't even trip on it about anything, you know, about how I'm feeling about anything, right? I don't, I don't publish all those poems, but I put them out there and I show people like, this is how I'm feeling. I'm a black man of a certain age from Detroit, Michigan, which is a very hard, real city, um, but we all feel things. We're not immune to feeling. I tell my brothers, I love them. When I leave this building, I'm gonna tell about two guys I love them on the way out. That's what we do, you know what I'm saying? So. I think by being an example of, of healthy masculinity, which is I've got to a point where I feel that way now. It was, I, didn't, I didn't always feel like a healthy masculinity upon myself. To be honest with you, I'm a man of, I grew up in the 90s, bro. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, Snoop, Andre, all of, you know, come on, man. Just dumb, dumb stuff. A lot of dumbness was happening back then in the day. And so I had to really grow a lot. I've always been a sensitive, nice person. But that don't mean I was always applying those things to my life and my treating of other people. You know what I'm saying? So... It's, it's a beautiful space to be in a mature, working, happy and healthy space with my, my masculinity, definitely. So just by being an example, man, you know, mm -hmm. that's it, that's all I can do. But then the men here, it's like the direct thing, we write. I'll give them a topic that they never thought of. You know, mm -hmm. we just had Women's History Month last month, right? We watched the Toni Morrison doc in two parts. <laughs> you know, uh, Wednesday, watched half, uh, another, next Wednesday, watched the other half. They wrote about an influ influential woman in their life that they knew. Mm. So I was like, if we all these yeah. men, let's give it up. Let's give it up to the sisters. Yeah. We all men and we love women. Come on now. We ain't all toxic. We ain't all dumb. <laughs> let's be honest. Let's write about an influential woman that you knew, not Harriet Tubman. Somebody actually, because I say that because somebody actually wrote about Sojourner Truth. I was like, brother, <laughs> you didn't hear the assignment. You did not know Sojourner Truth, bro. <laughs> if you did, I don't know how that worked, but right, I need right. that time to say. But besides that, yeah. So uh, just, we have to be an example. We have to learn. And then share what we learn. That's it. We have to be open and growing as men. We can't, you know, we got to fill ourselves so we can, you know. Yeah, help others feel, you know. Yep, yep. Now, you're a 2022 Live Arts Guild Award recipient. Yeah. Talk a little bit about your personal feelings at, at getting uh, this level of recognition. And, and what do you plan, how do you plan on using it? Man, I should have got that crazy. That's how I feel. <laughs> no, You're like, oh no, cut the cut the camera off. Now I'm playing. Uh, how do I feel? I got a, well, I got a guild for an emerging artist. Me being doing this for 25 plus years, but you know, hey, guess what? Uh, I'm gonna be honest with you. And I said this at the ceremony when I got the thing, and I, I wholeheartedly do appreciate this because I have been going very hard lately. So I do feel like. And yeah, I, I have a youthful vibe to me, bro. I ain't like some old guy out here that's like, stop. Uh, you know bro, you've been going hard for 25 years. I mean, as long as I've been. Yeah, I know, I know. But I think if I'm being realistic about it, for one, we, we, we're we gracious in our things, right? So I, I'm, I'm, I'm a very appreciative, very gracious on that. But I know, I know me, I know what I've done, what, what, what's happening in this city when it comes to the arts. I know what it is, you know what I'm saying? And so knowing that there's this, this appreciation, there's this deep appreciation for the recognition, but it's also a thing like, okay, you know what? Let me go extra hard because at the end of the day, a grant don't make me. I'm appreciative of the grant. But like they said, do it for yourself first. I'm very big on that. You know, I never thought I'd get a crazy girl I'd get. I feel like, I felt like, oh, politics and stuff, Detroit. I'll probably never get one. <laughs> That's how I felt. I was like, I'll probably never get one. I'm black to the mug out here doing this art for a lot of black folks all the time. Who knows? You know what I'm saying? And I know amazing people that have gotten crazy and guilt. It's all deserving. Real talk, everyone's deserving, you know what I'm saying? So it's all love, but I, I felt like I was never going to get one. I just apply it because it's the thing to do when, it, when the time comes. You know, you didn't, I didn't want to feel like I didn't do it. I, I knew I was deserving of one, um, but I'm giving you my honest feelings around it. Anybody watching this, apply. Apply for all the grants. Get the things you deserve, you know what I'm saying? But know that there's a whole city of people that that is your grant. These people are my grant. My first grant is people from Detroit. 
that pay five, 10, 20, $30 in tickets to come to my show. You know what I'm saying? That's the first grant I ever got was the community and the people. So focus on that first and all the other fruits will come your way. That's my advice. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm very happy. I'm very, the company's dope. So many dope people that have gotten Gildas and Kresge's, you know what I'm saying? I think the resources around it are really cool. You know, like they're like all the, the artists, uh, listen, there's so many things I didn't take advantage of. And Ebony was always, always sending me stuff. I love Ebony, by the way, Ebony Jones. She was sending me stuff all the time. Like, look, Ebony, so many grants and so many uh, things I could apply for. It's a lot. It's overwhelming. But um, I think I think get the grants, take advantage of the opportunities. But um, first and foremost, remember the people. Because if, if there's no business ever looking at you, no grant, no nothing, the people going to take care of you as long as you take care of them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's work in your residency at the Detroit Music Hall and talk about some of the work you've done there as well. Okay. Uh, Music Hall, yeah. Uh, yeah, I love Music Hall. I've been there whew, so many years. Uh, I love the staff there. I've done many events. That's where the Half Stack Poetry, Poetry Slam actually started. We had to move to Detroit Public Theater where I'm an artist in residence now for the next year. Um, uh, we had to move to uh, DPT because of space. You know, we were just over capacity. People sit on the floor, on steps, all of that. And so I'm at Detroit Public Theater now, but um, I'm still a resident artist at uh, Music Hall. I love Music Hall. Um, when I first started out with really like trying to make some money with poetry, like let me get like promoting my own events. For so long I was hosting for other people, you know, you know this. Right. And so then it was like, you know, mm -hmm. you know, I was like, let me really start branding my own thing so I could really sustain a thing, build it and sustain it, right? And so um, Jazz Cafe and, and Music Hall is my chance to really do that. They opened the doors to me, let me in, had me in the offices, had me with an office, you know what I'm saying? Had me doing mm -hmm. programming for you. Yeah, they did all that for me. Mm -hmm. And um, had me using the jazz cafe, activating the space, doing all these great things. We had people like Big Sean, Saul Williams, you know, or, or, Dom Cannon, all these amazing artists that came through and blessed like my program, which is Words and Rhythms of the D at the time. That's what I was doing, uh, programming with youth. Um, so I love musical. I love that space. I always will. I still do programs there. I'm actually doing a one man show there in May. So if anybody wants to check that out, please follow my socials. You're also an author, and you've actually released CDs as well. Talk about uh, that aspect of your art. Woo, people don't know that about the CDs. But I'll talk about the uh, books first. I'll talk about the books first. You you always remind okay, me right. of the music, and I love that. because Somebody <laughs> has to do that for me. Uh, yeah, but the books, man, like I'm a self-published author. I've published five books. Um, I'm going to reprint uh, three of them that I'm really proud of and start selling those again this summer. So look out for those. My last book was called The Detroit Poems, which is a collection of poems all about the city. You know, the good, the bad, the ugly, all the things we loved, all the things we know, the small little details that you just kind of like, oh, you got to be a Detroiter to like know about that. You know what I'm saying? You got to be from the city to know. So uh, that's the kind of person I am. I like to hit those chakras and stuff. So um, that's my last book. Look out for that. I'm reprinting that very soon. Like I want to have it actually ready in time for my one man show in May. So I got a lot of work ahead of me over the next couple of weeks. But um, yeah, that's coming very soon. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the music goes, man, like a lot of people don't notice, but I started in this whole thing as a rapper, you know what I'm saying? Right, yeah. Talk yeah. about that. Like, I got a lot of music, bro. Like, I'm, I'm, I got bars, man. I'm, I'm cold, bro. Like, I've been cold for a long, I'm still cold. I just, you know, get older. Like, okay, I'm Joe Fluent Green now. Let me, you know, start buttoning up and doing some some poetry. But uh, I love hip hop, man. That was my first introduction to creative writing. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. it, that's what it was. I didn't grow up reading all these great poets. You know what I'm saying? I grew up listening to you know, the, the Rakim and, and Common and, you know, Black Thought and all these guys, Diggable Planets, you know, you know what I listen oh, to. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, we, we, you know, we could trade music all day. So um, that's what, that's my first introduction to creative writing. Me wanting to be like those guys, you know, the fresh dudes that was doing hip hop. That's what I wanted to be, you know what I'm saying? And so that's what I did for so long. When I went to Mahogany, I was reading my raps as poems. I wasn't even, you know, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't thinking about, I was like, oh, this is cool. It's open mic so I can rap. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was thinking, and I was around serious ass poets, and right. now a lot of them, not a lot of them poets ain't poets no more. And I here I am, grown in a mug, a serious ass poet. <laughs> it's you so know, crazy. One thing I've been meaning to ask you, and this is going back to the mahogany days, because you you were the host, but you also had a DJ, yeah. and uh, you know, to me. I had never seen that before, but after that, it seems like everybody had a DJ with a host, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know, man. You you try to get something started, Chris. I don't know. I, I, listen, I didn't invent all this thing, man, but I know what you're saying, though. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, shout out to DJ, DJ Invisible. I love you, Carl, my brother, DJ Invisible. Man. And he's all over the world now. He's a world traveling DJ. 
he's probably in Austria, Austria or Toledo, one of the two. I don't know. <laughs> he's somewhere, <laughs> either somewhere exotic or somewhere, you know, wherever. But he's always traveling. Uh, so shout out to Carl, man. But yeah, we I mean, we made it fun. We we're both goofy, fun guys. You know what I'm saying? So we made it like fun, not really pretentious. We had skits and stuff. You know what I'm saying? It was like a, it was a fun vibe. Yeah, and it was yeah. a synthesis between music and spoken word. Because now, I mean, yeah. you know, people are releasing spoken word albums. Uh, you know, to me, like Ursula Rucker, you know, really kind of set a lot of that off. You know, and mm -hmm. it seems she like did, it, yeah. it's it's in vogue now to release spoken word albums. You know, and I, you know, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm gonna say some of that synthesis may have come out of mahogany. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> Yeah, I'm putting, I'm, I'm laying it out there. I'm laying it out there. The flowers are coming. The flowers oh, man. Are coming. I don't know. You know, even before Mahogany, there were spots that are poor me. Mahogany is a child. Yeah, poor, of poor me. Cabin. Yeah, true. Poor That's me. real. Right, and so, right, yeah. I mean, just being honest about like, I've seen the whole thing as far as Mike from 18 and up, right? So, when I entered the scene at 18 and up, I've seen it all in the city of Detroit for sure. And so, I've seen the history of it. And definitely, Mahogany deserves so much credit. I've been to other states. I've, when I lived in Chicago, you know, I moved to Chicago like in 99. And when I, I lived that. there for, for a minute, I definitely saw the mahogany influence. They won't tell you that probably, but mm -hmm. <laughs> I saw it though. I saw it for sure. I knew that. I knew cats that were coming to, to Detroit. It was a destination. If you were in the Midwest, you would come to mahogany for sure. Because you heard about it. Yeah. You know, and at that time, the, the black underground was underground. It was literally mm -hmm. underground. You had to know people, find stuff, you know, that's what it was. So Absolutely. it was more of an effort to kind of engage it, I think, you know. Let's get one more comment here about Detroit, because uh, to me, there, there's no other place like Detroit. Kresge is an uh, organization that really has shown a spotlight on the arts in Detroit. Anywhere you go in the country, people know that you're sort of from Detroit, just based on just how distinctive and distinguished our artistic community is. Just talk about how being a Detroiter has informed your art over the years and, and the value that you've been able to see in it. God, that's self-belief, man. We were all famous here. I was famous before I got any recognition in Detroit. You know what I'm saying? We, I feel like we're all we're all very much about ourselves. We have a chip on our shoulder, a healthy chip, because mm -hmm. we're, we're a city full of a lot of, we get a lot of hate from other places. Yeah. You know, there are certain places that Detroit, Cleveland, whatever, people don't, unless you're from there, it's hard to love it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, everybody mm -hmm. loves New York and LA and all these, you know, even Atlanta gets love from being Atlanta, but Detroit is kind of like, we're recognized as being cool. If, if when people meet Detroiters, they know we're cool. We're cool people. We're real chill. We're not really all that pretentious. We're fun. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, um, that Detroitness in me, it gives me a certain edge, a certain chip on my shoulder, um, a certain relaxed, not taking myself too serious vibe. I think because even mm -hmm. though I believe in myself, I'm not like trying to be all out here you know, like that guy, you know what I'm saying? I'm not trying to be that one. I'm trying to be like the kind of guy that's relatable and chill and like, we're from the Midwest. You know what I'm saying? I go to New York and be extra all day, man. People talking everything up, don't be doing nothing. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, what do you do actually? What do you actually really do? Because we're sitting here talking, it's like a lot of talk, but like, what's the work? You know what I'm saying? I think Detroit's, we're about the work. We're, you can't fool us. We're actually literally about the work. So you, you, we deserve the chip on our shoulder because we actually do the work. A lot of places don't earn it. They'll talk it up. And then try to cover up the fact that they don't really do the work. You know what I'm saying? But we do the work. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's just healthy being from here, man. Listen, I, I wouldn't recommend anybody stay here forever. You know, you dip. God bless you. You know what I'm saying? I love <laughs> I love, <laughs> I, love, I, love <laughs> I love I love the city, but listen, you know. Oh, there's one more thing I want to say too, because I don't want to sound yeah. like I, I didn't get the, like I thought I was gonna get the Kresge because like, oh, I I'm so deserving. And I, no, this is the thing, right? For one, I kind of phoned in my two applications. That's the truth. Like the first two, couple of times I applied, you know, you young, you don't really know. I'm just filling out stuff. I want to get this a grant. I just phoned it in, doing stuff last minute. It didn't really take it all that serious, you know. And then after a while, I was like, I probably won't get one anyway. Then I got serious because I've been serious about my life and my performing and my work so hard over the past few years. So I was like, oh, I deserve this. Let me apply. I probably won't get it, but I do deserve it. So let me apply. So that's what got me one. So you got to mm -hmm. feel deserving. You got to actually put the work into. Crazy's not going to pick you just off your reputation. I mean, that's nice, you know what I'm saying? But really the truth is you got to really show them why they should pick you. We know what we do. All these black folks in city of Detroit know what I do. But just because I do don't mean someone behind a desk working for Cressy is going to know what you do or the panelists that decide that are like nationally, you know, people from all over, right? So you have to really show who you are, what you do, your value, 
what you actually mean to your community, whatever it means to you, all that. You got to really put the work in. That's real. I want to say that before I leave this because there are people watching this. I'm sure they're going to want, you know, a grant and apply for one. So apply, please apply. But be serious about the application process. Take your time. Don't start last minute. I've done that. And be real about it. That's it. I just want to say that. Real talk. Real talk. Yeah. At this time, we're going to bring Dave back on and just have sort of just a kind of final round and wrap up. And let's see, check the chat real quick. So in terms of just wrapping this up, um, for the, and this is a question to both of you, uh, you know, for those that want to keep track of you, you know, where can they go online to do so? And, and for those that are looking to um, embrace their art in much the same way that you have, uh, what are some words of affirmation, some words of motivation that you can give them to keep going, to keep trying? Because, you know, it, it's it's hard out here for an artist. So what are some words of encouragement that you can give to artists out here that are especially doing art in your discipline? How can they keep going, especially if they may be encountering challenges or discouragement? We'll start off with Day. Oh, okay. Um, a friend of mine, his name is Chunino Lowe. He's a trumpeter. Um, but he always tells me, uh, take care of the music and the music will take care of you. Um, so I feel like that's really it for me. It's like I put the art first and really put a lot of intention and care into it. Um, and then after that, I know like most things are out of my control. But if I stay in tune with the things that I can control, which is the practice, um, then I think that always keeps you grounded. Mm -hmm. And where can people go to keep track of you, Day? Uh, how can um, right now, uh, my Instagram is mm -hmm. Day Vicious. I think Ebony put it in the chat. Um, but it's Day Vicious, D A A Y V I C I O U S. Um, yeah, mainly there right now. I'm working on the website, but for right now, Day Vicious. Awesome. And Joel? How about yourself? What words of advice would you have for those artists who may be hitting that wall? They may be going on, undergoing some discouragement and they just need that that word of wisdom, that little nugget to help them keep going. What would you say? Hmm. You got to have that spirit. You got to be tenacious out here. You got to have that spirit. The ones that make it successfully and have the, have the most impact in whatever you're doing um, have a very healthy spirit of not giving up. And I know that's not easy. I've dealt with a lot of, I still deal with anxiety, like social anxiety, like one-on-one, -on -one, this is easy for me, right? Doing this right now. Mm -hmm. But there are times things like this aren't easy for me. So um, I would recommend, um, you know, if you need therapy, do that. Do Love on yourself, right? Take care of yourself, eat well, you know, travel when you can, be healthy, love people, find love for your life, all these things while you're making your art. Just remember to really take care of yourself. That's my advice. It took me a long time to really realize I had to really fully take care of myself and love on myself, especially when you're a black man doing something, anything. You know, we don't go to the doctor enough. We don't need you know, that. So, so anybody watching this, if you're a young artist, um, take care of yourself. Um, take care of the people around you. Nurture your relationships. You know, keep growing and building. And don't take yourself too seriously. Take your art seriously. Take your work seriously. And take yourself seriously when it comes time to. But, you know, um, just have fun with it. Life's meant to be enjoyed for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, this was, uh, oh, this was great for my me. socials. Oh. I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't so say that. I'm about, I'm sitting here giving some sound advice. I forgot. So, Joel Fluent Green, uh, social media, Instagram, like Dave. What up, Dave? You're dope, by the way, Dave. So, what's hey, up? you too. Uh, <laughs> man, come on, man. I feel your spirit. I felt that. Like, that's what's up, my sister. To get it. Build it from the ground up. Get it out the mud off rip. <laughs> the universe is going to take care of you. You know what I'm saying? So, no, blessings to you and everything you do. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, and Trunino, Trunino Lowe, by the way, that's another smart brother that left Detroit. Yeah, I love, so shout him. Out to Trunino. love him. I love Trunino. I love Trunino. Yeah. That's a good brother. Uh, but uh, so uh, Joel Fluent Green Instagram. My website is joelfluentgreen.com. Green with the E at the end. Don't forget that. All right. Yeah. Well, Joel, Day, this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for spending your time, taking time out of your busy schedules to really talk about your art, the craft behind it, your methodologies, and just the uplift the uplift because we need more of that and uh, thank you so much to all of you for joining us today for this fascinating moving compelling conversation we hope you enjoyed it and leave today feeling more deeply connected not only to these artists but the artistic scene itself please continue to remain in touch with day and joel green the uh, contacts and the socials and all the digits are in chat 
If you'd like to rewatch this program, you can do so when it's posted on Kresge Arts and Detroit Presents Art within the next few days. And we hope you'll join us again for our last installment of the series that's coming up Thursday, April 27th at noon, featuring artists Carl George and Anitra Cole. All right, thank you again. My name is Chris Campbell on behalf of Kresge Arts and WDET. Thank you for making today's salon meaningful. Until next time, see ya. Peace. Thank you. All right, Chris. Appreciate you, brother. Appreciate